You know what that means? Time for Gene Shepherd, And this morning, uh, a program from February 8th of 1965. Not one of the uh, all-out last shows, but more of a, uh, well, in keeping with the theme this evening, a little more science. Protective coloration and the pecking order is our theme. Enjoy the theme for another moment or two, and then bring in Gene Shepard, who starts a little bit uh, <laughs> later than the program, actually. Uh, seems like the tape didn't quite start in time, but you won't miss much. So, enjoy. Episode of Gene Shepard. WBAI. Fantastic day. All right, that's it. Kill it, kill it, kill it, kill it there. Oh, we don't have enough time. Life is going by. What a fantastic day. Now, no, wait. Before you go back there, watch carefully now, Skip. You just watch old Daddy here. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, yep, the first one that I gave you. That's what we want. What a fantastic day. Uh, oh, boy, it was like summer, you know. He broke all the records and all that stuff. Sends the old blood a coursing through the veins. Brings out all those little... Those little things, you know, the little green shoots. Uh, do you mind if I read a poem to celebrate this fantastic day? Would you please give me uh, fantastic day music? Da, 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 bring it up there. Come on. Oh, oh just envelop us in this. As I awoke this morning, when all sweet things are born, a robin perched upon my sill to signal the coming dawn. The bird was joyful, young and gay, and so sweetly did he sing the thought of happiness and joy into my heart did bring. I smiled. I smiled softly at the cheery song. And then, as it paused in moment low, I gently closed the window down and crushed his stupid skull. Oh, what a what a talk! Now, now, I just just had to read that to you. You know, <laughs> it just it scares the uh, you know what out of you. I'll tell you, uh, every. Every month, I get periodicals from all over the country, all kinds of magazines, look, life, whoopee, zip, trick, wow, all, all the yeah, top <laughs> magazines of our time. And among other things, I get at least three or four prison newspapers. And I read them avidly. This is a prison newspaper printed by the... Inhabitants of a, and of course it's like any other trade journals. It's all about the trade. <laughs> I mean that's all they write about is is the jug, uh, uh, various jug news from various other jugs. They write about uh, uh, speeches that penologists give in different places. They report it in full. Uh, they report about what the prison bowling team does. And of course there's a lot of little social notes, you know, uh, little things that are said in the mess hall and. Various comments that come out of the uh, black hole, or some guys on bread and water, that kind of thing. And this was uh, in their poetry department. This was a bit of poetry submitted by a prisoner for the prison newspaper. Would you like to hear it again, friends? You wouldn't like to hear it again? You know, <laughs> isn't it funny how how almost every uh, new, uh, every every uh, prison movie these days, TV show, whatever, whatever it might be. You watch the uh, you watch the unfolding of the life in the prison and you watch the people and you watch the, the story as it's being told. And almost invariably they give you to imply, they give you to feel that somehow these are just basically nice people. <laughs> They're basically nice people who didn't get the love of a mother or 
their father didn't love them or they ran into some bad company. Although I don't know who the bad company is. Uh, when you think about it, the bad company also involves unloved, uh, no mothers, no fathers. So it goes all the way back to the original. I suppose the original kid that was in bad company was the original son of Adam and Eve. I presume uh, he started right out in the wrong foot. But you would never think, uh, judging from the attitude of so many people today writing about prison life, that a prisoner could simply be a bad guy. <laughs> simply a bad guy. I gently closed the window down and crushed his stupid skull. That's what we call in the trade the anti-social attitudes. At least Andy Robin attitudes. It's lovely, isn't it? It's, uh, gee, it's Monday, isn't it? It just suddenly occurred to me. It's scary. Everybody's walking on eggs. Uh, you know, the feeling that the weekend... The weekend, uh, the weekend still holds good. There's just a little taste of it, a little touch of it in the air. In fact, I went a cab driver the other night. He's giving me his entire philosophy of the week. And it's uh, like on a Tuesday night, see, I get in the cab and there's nothing stirring. And I say, boy, is it quiet tonight, isn't it? We ride along a little bit for a while. And he's thinking about that. And he says, yeah, it's Tuesday. I said, yeah, that's true, it's Tuesday. Nothing happened. Yeah, but wait till tomorrow. So Wednesday tomorrow, you know. They'll start, uh, they'll start scratching. I said, so they start scratching on Wednesday? Yeah, but nothing like Thursday. Oh, boy, then they start really going. Thursday. And then by Friday, they're on the phone. The whole scene starts yelling, fighting, hollering around. Oh, boy. Monday, they just sit. Tuesday, they figure it's no use. But Wednesday, they start scratching. And then, yeah, it is Monday, isn't it? We haven't started the scratch yet. But, of course, there are a lot of ways to scratch in this great hen yard that we live in. Uh, how's, your, how's your pecking order doing, let me, friends? Uh, have you read much lately about the pecking order? Have you uh, felt that, uh, that there might be some inequities or iniquities in it? In fact, the other night I'm sitting around and somebody's talking about, uh, uh, well, of course, uh, in this society, uh, in this society, uh, we should have uh, uh, some kind of... Uh, way to take care of guys that get in trouble and guys that get mad and so on. In this society, it's always called in this society. When animals themselves have pecking orders of unbelievable rigidity, you put 17 hens in a hen yard, and within five minutes, you got a boss hen, you got a number two hen, you got a number three hen, and way down at the bottom is number 17. Just scratch. How do you stand in the pecking order, friend? <laughs> well, of course, well, we've uh, we've come pretty much uh, a long trail. We don't have much worries about that because we've learned how to engineer ourselves. Something that none of the other animals have done. Very few bears walk around out in the woods pretending they're uh, giraffes. Uh, very few giraffes walk around trying to pretend they're Kelso. Uh, <laughs> I wonder whether a horse knows he's a horse. You know, I, I did often thought about that. When a horse is running around a track... And he sees all those klutzes yelling. I wonder whether he, whether he has any, what, what he thinks about this. I wonder what a horse thinks about it when a big fat lady gets up on top of it. Says, giddy up. <laughs> I just, you know, just a, a little passing observation. I'm often wondered about that. When a dog is walking along the street and this lady's got a hold of the little silver chain, you know, dogs running around under the wheels of the cars doing what dogs do under the wheels of cars, you know. I wonder, I wonder what the dog thinks. The dog goes back up, and there's the lady standing there, casually looking in the other direction, like she pretends like she's not seeing what's happening. And so, so she stands there. That's always an embarrassing moment for very prissy ladies, when, you know, when dogs are dogs. And I've, uh, I'm wondering about what animals uh, think about people. Of course, we like to assume they think the same things about us that we think about them. Uh, you, you, you see this running through all kinds of radio shows and television shows. Lassie somehow is also building the superhighway. I saw Lassie uh, 
chapter and went, I couldn't believe it. You know, it was like the engineers kept consulting with Lassie and whether or not they should have 20. Well, yeah, they were always building this road, you know, and they'd cut to Lassie all the time. You see the guy saying, all right, Charlie, get them bulldozers over here now. We're going to start on the shoulders here. All right, let's go. Here's the blueprints. we got a 17-foot. The bulldozers go. Then we cut to Lassie, and Lassie's nodding approvingly. I'm going to cry it out loud. I mean, I, I wonder if Lassie has got the uh, has got the Howard Johnson concession that they're about to put on on this super high. <laughs> no, there is this feeling. Uh, people say, oh, well, you know, old Charlie, my dog. Charlie likes to ride in the car. Does Charlie know Charlie's riding in a car? Oh, yeah, yeah, you think he does. Huh? Charlie knows about cars. Huh? Well, I don't know. It took us 18 million years to come to the point where we understood what a car was. A lot of people still don't. You know, but Charlie knows, uh, the old dog, huh? Uh, or does he think the scenery is going past him? Now, this is quite conceivable, you know. Is he aware that he is in a, a vehicle that's moving? Or does he just think there's something unreeling? Does he even recognize it as the scenery? Or does it just seem to be some big blur, moving thing out there? And, and anything that's moving fascinates him, you know. Of course, many animals are fascinated by just a, a plain movement, you know, any kind of a movement. A dog, you move fast, the dog will be interested in it. Now, is he interested in riding because he sees a lot of movement out there? Is that what it is? And on the other hand, a horse, you know, I heard, I heard a jockey say, Yeah, well, of course, uh, old Big Fred, Big Fred's got plenty of hot, you know. Big Fred's got courage. Courage. Now, I, I think, well, well, isn't this a, is this a a, uh, a trait that an animal can have? You think so? Well, I don't know. Uh, you have to judge it by animal standards, and not not. To, I think it would be more courageous for a horse not to run than to run, because everybody wants it to run. They're out there, they're hitting it and yelling, and they sit on the top and say "giddy up." Well, maybe they're talking about obedience. No, you think it's courage. <laughs> well, I suppose you also then have the uh, idea that, that horses and dogs and turtles are capable of romantic love. You don't think so? Oh, well, 97.9% uh, .9 of the uh, kennel ration users believe that. Oh, sure they do. Well, if a dog is not capable of love, then how can it be capable of courage? Because courage is a form of love. Yeah, it really is when you think very carefully and uh, long and hard and philosophically about it. Uh, courage and love are very closely allied. And you say that they're capable of courage but not love. Now, be careful. Be careful. Uh, now, is a, is a uh, horse or an animal of any kind capable of then, let us say, cowardice? Oh, you think they are. You mean because they run away? Is that cowardice? No. Yeah, you mean because they don't run fast when the others are running past it. That's cowardice. Maybe he doesn't see the sense in running. Could it be that he just sees the basic ridiculousness of trying to make life better for the $2, uh, the $2 cheapies? Sit in the stands there. At the, is, do you think a horse has a concept at all of winning? Of beating the other horses? To the, uh, you know, around there to the other thing there. You really do. You think that. Oh, that's curious. I don't know about that. Uh, that's a, uh, something that uh, I don't think has ever satisfactorily been uh, argued out. Now, uh, is the cat... A lot of people think, you know, a cat is too intelligent to be obedient. I've heard that said many times. Oh, well, cats are just so fantastic. They, uh, uh, that's the reason why cats, you can never housebreak them or anything else, is because they're just too intelligent. Uh, they they're just too too intelligent, you know. Uh, to they're not like dogs, you know. Dogs are sycophants. They why many time you come into the house and the dog jumps up and puts his arms around your knees and hangs out to you and wets all over your shoes and squeaks and yells and ah, 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 you know holy smokes no cat ever does that oh no and they'll say well that shows that cats are better well maybe it just shows that cats are dumber. You know, <laughs> cats just can't learn to tell their owner from anybody. You know, they could very quite possibly be. I, did you see that wild scene on television <laughs> the other day? It showed some lady that was being interviewed at the cat show. And she had this cat. 
uh, and she was holding the cat up, and she talked to the cat throughout the entire interview. Did not talk to the TV interviewer, who was maybe Gabe Pressman or somebody. Uh, never once uh, saw him and says, Oh, little boy here, aren't you? He says, Well, how much does your cat get for modeling? And she says, Well, uh, uh, Dicky boy used to only get $50 an hour, but then it just, uh, well, he just decided to raise his rates. He now gets $100 an hour. Don't you, Dickie boy? Oh, what's he puts he puts The Dickie boy just sort of stared up there, two fangs hanging down, and the claws sticking out all over. So, what's he puts he puts he puts And he says, "Well, uh, uh, who gets all the money? Does what does he spend it on? Well, you know how he is. He's got girlfriends, you know. Ooh, boop, 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 boop. He spends it on girlfriends. He's got this whole myth going. Oh, wow." <laughs> Oh, it's so sad, you know. Uh, speaking of myths, this is WOR FM, New York. And uh, did you see the uh, wildly sad... Uh, I, I put this in my vast pile of trivia because I think this little piece should be put into some big book on how it was in our time. It was a one ad, and it said $500 reward for the return of this French poodle. This French poodle, which was lost from the corner of 60th and Madison Avenue out of a white, brand-new Thunderbird. It says, please return this poodle. It is the only thing I have in this whole world. Holy smokes. Holy smokes. Uh, the significance of it, of course, is the neighborhood from which the dog was lost. <laughs> Jumped out of a white Thunderbird. And, and the, the, the abject quality of the entire piece, and the, the, the belief, of course, that the person, of course, had lost another person, was very quite evident. Uh, this, uh, this has always intrigued me, this concept. Of course, uh, we ourselves are animals, and it's very hard for us to separate. I guess we're the only animal that gets hung up on other animals. I, I don't know. I, I know that a horse will stand in the barn and will love to have a dog with it, but I don't know of any horses that go out and collect dogs. Uh, I have never yet run across a chipmunk that has a turtle for a pet. Uh, I don't know uh, any groundhogs that have ever gone out to, to buy, a, let's say, a goldfish. But, but man, of course, is, a, is another story entirely. And, and being an animal, though, we have the dark stygian fears. We're like a chameleon. I think the one thing that man has uh, that he shares with other animals is protective coloration. He, he assumes the color of the atmosphere that he lives in. Uh, the the uh, the whole the whole uh, round thing, the culture that he lives in. He begins to assume it very quickly. Have you ever had a have you ever had a chameleon? You know, that was a big deal when I was a kid. And whenever the carnival came to town, or the circus, there was always some guy in a straw hat standing around, and he had this, this big uh, velvet card, great big placard. And on it were maybe 100 or 200 beautiful little jade green chameleons with a tiny gold chain on their neck with a pin. And they sold for, I don't know, quarter, half dollar, something like that. And he would say, here they are, the chameleons. Here they are, the beautiful little chameleons will assume any color. Any color, they're beautiful pets. They take care of the flies in your house. And then he would take the chameleon and he would put it on a, on a piece of red cloth. And instantly, the chameleon would begin to get this sort of a dusty rose red color. Have you ever seen him do it? They really do, you know. And then he would take the same chameleon and he'd say, now watch this. And he would drop the chameleon on a yellow cloth. And then the chameleon would look around, look around with his little beady eyes, his tongue would go, you know, little things sticking out there. And then he would slowly begin to change from dusky rose red. He would become a kind of pale yellow. And then, after a couple of seconds, he would just sort of fade right off, just just meld right into the cloth. I said, boy, wow. Well, about every couple of years, I would get a chameleon, which would make my mother go completely ape. Uh, if there's anything she would yell about, it's a chameleon. And, and uh, we would bring them home, and the whole idea of a chameleon was he fed himself. You know, you didn't have to feed chameleons. 
at least in Indiana, because we had plenty of flies. Indiana is covered by a thick coating of flies. And uh, we would just come home and take the chameleon and, and hook it on, hook it out of your sweater. So he would climb around, and they had these diamond-shaped, you know, these diamond, uh, uh, almost like argyle sweaters. They were this diamond the pattern, and the poor little chameleon would climb around, red and green and yellow diamonds. And he's looking around. <laughs> he's he's they, they, many a schizoid uh, flipped uh, a chameleon would result from those sweaters. And so we would we would hook them on and pin them, and the chameleon would. And of course, we use it to scare chicks and the whole scene. But when the chameleon was really going, you would put him on the curtains. Just pin him on the curtains, and the chameleon would hang there. Just hang there, day after day, not saying a thing, just quietly hang there. And every time a fly came within ten feet of the chameleon, he would begin to exude some kind of a sweet something. He attracted. They would attract flies. And the, and the fly would go, and for some reason or other, the flies were insanely attracted by these, these deadly creatures. They were deadly for flies. It was like you being attracted. I think we're gener uh, generally, most of us are attracted by things like snakes, dangerous things. Men are attracted by wars, which, of course, are dangerous. They're attracted by them, though. Uh, men are attracted by racers, racing 200 miles an hour. These are killers. And yet you stand next to it, and somehow it attracts you, right, Skip? Uh, you're you're attracted by things like if I came in here and I laid it on the desk here, just put it down there, and I have gigantic Roscoe. If I had a 45 automatic, a big Roscoe, boom! Within five minutes, everybody'd be standing here, kind of looking at it. I know that. It's it's, it's sense of of attraction by danger. Well, the flies were hung on coming around these chameleons. And you'd see them. We'd watch them. I'd sit on the, on the couch. My kid brother would sit down on the floor. And you'd see these flies come around. And that chameleon's just sitting there silently. Doesn't move. Kind of raised up. You know, they have these little claws. And he's kind of raised up. Beautiful. They're like a little jewel. Beautiful green jewel. And then a fly would come down and start to buzz him. You know, gone. Just like that. You couldn't even, he was so fast you couldn't see him do it. Just like, like something flicked, flick of an eyebrow, something. Just, and then there'd be silence. And then you'd hear, another one is coming in now. He's another guy. He's coming. Gone. Well, I got to be a chameleon fan. <laughs> little, little did I know. Yeah, little did I know that I was looking at a foretaste of life to be. That we're living in a world of chameleons who are not only very quick with the, with the fly catching scene, but are also adept at changing colors. Uh, this is what's known as conformity. You know, people say conformity. Well, uh, wherever wherever you go in any given society, you go down to 14th Street, you hang around down to the village, and if you're wearing uptown clothes. You begin to feel like you're totally conspicuous. You're out of the whole. You're how, you're out of it. And gradually, if you go downtown enough, you will assume the coloration of down there. On the other hand, if a guy lives in the world, I have a friend who has a whole set of different outfits. He has. He's got a whole closet of uptown outfits, West Side outfits. Yeah, he's got a West Side suit. You know, it's got big wide lapels and sharp jazzy chains hanging all over. He's got a West Side suit. And he's got an east side suit. It's a little skinny black, charcoal black uh, Italian silk suit. You know, skinny one with little skinny ties, a little skinny shirt, little skinny shoes. That's his east side suit. And then, of course, he's got his downtown hippie suit. And that's a Mexican serape with stirrups. And it has a <laughs> yeah, the whole suit. You know, he's got he's got uh, yeah, he's got these uh, he's got these uh, shoes, uh, sandals made out of tires. Big straps that come around and hang onto his kneecaps. And he walks around. He's got a little folding guitar. And that's his downtown suit. I'm not putting it on. He really is. And one time, <laughs> one time I'm walking. He gets in Midtown, you see, and he's got a little confusion there. And we're walking along. And, and I said, well, how about let's go in for lunch? And he said, where do you want to go? And I named some place and it happened to be on the east side. He says, oh, well, i got to go home and change clothes. And I said, what do you mean change clothes? He said, yeah. He says, I can And sure enough, 15 minutes later, he joined me, and he's got his east side suit up. Right? You know? <laughs> it's the protective coloration. Now, a lot of people find that they can't do it very well. 
And that's, therein lies the nub and the crux and the hub and the axle of a tremendous publishing world. There are thousands of books out today which say in seven minutes, just seven minutes a day, in one week, I can convert you into a dynamic, hard-hitting, fantastic dictator. Realize your potentials. Become rotten. Step on the busted shoulder blades of your friends. Go all the way to the pinnacle. Yeah, somebody's going to do it. Why not you? Now, these are the uh, protective coloration books on how to assume a position that is not yours. Now, the question arises, what color is a chameleon? What is the chameleon's color? What is the chameleon's color? Uh, what is a person's uh, identity today? It's very hard for him to know. You know, they're, they're writing novel after novel after novel called The Search for Identity. Uh, what is this guy? A man who works all day long in an office where he never sees the work they do. You know, there are thousands of guys who work here at WOR who never listen to the radio. Many of them don't even know we're in the radio business. As far as they're concerned, we're in the office business. You know? <laughs> we're, just, uh, we're here to make the papers go back and forth and to get the checks and to make the phone calls and have lunch and all that stuff. And once in a great while, you'll see one of these confused guys will drift up from the 23rd floor, Skip. Confused guy, and he says, "What is this?" You know, he says, "Guess the feeling." He's, he, he'll, he'll drift up into the studio area here, and he sees these microphones and these these newsmen running around and Shepard and the whole crowd here. And he, he, you can see immediately, he feels alien. He's in an alien atmosphere, and he drifts down back to the twenty-third floor, or the twentieth floor, where he's safe. Now, what is this guy's identity? You know, is he? What does he do? Does he? Does he weave? Does he spin? What is, his, what, is his, uh, what is his function? On the other hand, he's going with a girl who's nine feet tall. Big, tall, tough chick who's uh, singing a Broadway musical. And she's got this, <laughs> she's got this function. So what, what, what happens? Well, you know, the idea of protective coloration. Skip, were you with me here now, man? I'm going to have to have some romantic music here. Because many magazines today are issuing almost hourly bulletins on how to assume another color, another uh, intermezzo is what I want. How to assume another color or how to assume another uh, a chameleon color I'm talking about here. How to assume another thing. And uh, you got it up there, Skip? Hey, hey, you with me there? You don't have it yet? Well, then give me the first one then. That's okay. I can't wait for you. Just give me the first one we used. Just, just give me the first one. I think that's good enough because it... Uh, it uh, tells the story. Now, oh, no, not yet. No, no, never give it to me time. Give me the cue. No, 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 no. Don't just whip it in there. All set up in there now? All right, now. Now, uh, the question is here before the house. I'm going to put this away in my vast file of trivia so they know, they know how we became what we are. You are aware, aren't you, that as you go to a cocktail party and all those beautiful people are around there, those people who know how to say things somehow they fit. You go to a you go to a uh, an opening night at Lincoln Center. There's a certain kind of fitness of the way certain people are. You go to an art gallery, and there are people who seem to fit. Uh, you go to a chic East Side art type movie house. You know, and you're down there drinking that that Colombian coffee or whatever it is they give you down there. That ink. Uh, you're sitting down there. There are certain people who seem to fit. They're there. They're really there. And you feel like an interloper. Well, has it ever occurred to you these people study that? You can take courses in that. Actually, here from a major magazine, which is uh, sent all over the country, is an example of how to make the scene big. And look, fellas, this is for men. This is directed, this whole article is directed towards women. I wonder how many times have you sat across the table from a chick and she's got a funny, glazed look in the eye like she isn't really with you. Have you had that feeling? And uh, you talk to her and she sort of drifts away and then comes back with what appears to be the perfect attitude. Listen carefully. This is for women and it's illustrated beautifully. This might answer a few, little, little music that plays. The question... The title of the article is, Sweeten Your Personality. Get the most out of what you are 
and add just a little bit more. Now, the first question is, can you make a dramatic entrance? It is wise to dramatize an entrance if you arrive at a party that's already in full swing. Pause as you enter. Have a humorous anecdote ready to explain your lateness, which you have contrived to achieve, and the ensuing merriment will alert other guests as to your spectacular, dramatic entrance. And here she comes in the room. Blanche is making her entrance. She is working at it hard. A thoughtful guest will not steal the scene from the hostess, but will instead direct attention toward her. Here in our illustration, a late arriving guest offers her hostess a huge Mexican paper rose. A memento of tourist friends whose unexpected stopover on their way home had caused the guest's delayed appearance at the party. And she cleverly thought to bring it along. Yes. Now, the next statement they make is this. Each of us now and then needs to take stock of her special feminine attributes and make sure that she's including enough sugar and spice and everything nice. In my work, this is recording the author here, sweetening and flavoring the personality. Get very careful attention. And so I have to ask all of you girl-type listeners out there, are you properly using the sugar that all little girls are made out of? Are you using the spice that we all know little girls are made out of? Well, now, here's another suggestion from the world of showbiz. How to convert yourself into a total phonus balonus in 17 minutes of hard work every day. Have you explored... This is a great question. Have you explored the sweet use of pet names? Yes, a pet name makes another person feel that he or she has a special place in your life and thoughts. So think of large numbers of extra clever pet names. Those students I like best, I term my petty pies. And each member of the petty pie league sooner or later gets his or her own special pet name. A pet name, and this goes for the general one, such as Honey, a darling, should be spoken only with sweetness and good feeling. And when you are out of patience with one that you love and can't keep the snap out of your voice, call him by his proper name. <laughs> yes, work on a good list of uh, pet names, friends. Pick and choose them well, carefully. Now, now, here's another thing perhaps you haven't been doing lately, friends. Do you smooth your way with magic words? Magic words? Are you using magic words, friend, in your life? Maybe that's what's wrong. Please, thank you. I'm sorry. You have been most helpful. Such magic words sweeten every encounter. Be sure that you use them well and judiciously and have a good stock. Please, 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 please. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, here is a question that uh, perhaps uh, might answer a lot of uh, problems, a little hang-ups maybe some of you chicks have had. Maybe you have been uh, thinking seriously about this. When should you be utterly helpless? Well, I mean, think about this. I mean, you know, a lot of people are helpless at the wrong times, and a lot of people are not helpless when they should be. Well, this is a bad scene. So the question is, when should you be utterly helpless? Well, here's the answer. When it would be awkward to be anything else. That's the time to be utterly helpless. A broken shoe strap or heel while sightseeing. Look frantic 
and let others find a solution. Offer to bring the car around, for example. Let others do these things. Or to seat you somewhere while you are playing utterly helpless. <laughs> the point is, this chick, no, she's about as helpless, believe me, as a stainless steel turtle. <laughs> she has to play utterly helpless. How many times have you, you know, uh, that, that is one of the most frustrating things I think of in modern life, in this urban situation that we all find ourselves, that men constantly have to face. You know, men are... are in a, in a strange way, Skip, men are still bound by the ancient laws of politeness and chivalry, whereas women aren't. And so they have a peculiar inbuilt advantage. It's like a, a weight advantage. It's like a, a jockey. <laughs> it's like a horse, you know. How many times have you gone out to get a cab and you see somebody right down the street, you know, they're, they're, they've been out there for ten minutes, and you feel funny about going out in front of them in other words, short-stopping them, they call it in the Army, on a cab. Men constantly have this feeling. I've seen men, men all the time will walk down and sort of, you know, gee whiz, there's a guy out there. They're not going to... A woman? Let me tell you. She goes, hey, cab, cab, cab! And it stops and slews up <laughs> right up front. There's just no question about it. It's a peculiar kind of, I suppose you might say, uh Barbarism, in a way. They're not bound by those little subtle laws of chivalry. And so a man is constantly in a, at, a, at a disadvantage when he's with somebody, a chick, for example, and has to get a cab, you know, rush hour. And so he goes out there and he plays the game. You know, he, he whistles and the girl says, Watch out, let me get one. Cab, cab. She runs out and hurls herself in front of the cab, grabs a hold of the, grabs a hold of the grill. <laughs> Why, I'll tell you, I saw one of the most humiliating things I've seen in years. The other day, I saw a family on a street corner, a father, a mother, and two girls. And one girl was about 10, and I'd say the other girl was about 12, something like that. And they were both these little short, round, tank-like girls. Uh, you could just see that, that the entire east side had been lavished on them. I, I'm sure they take fencing lessons, dancing lessons, tank driving lessons, bull whip lessons. They take Croatian Greek lessons. They take lessons in lessons. Uh, they take lessons in acting, singing, dancing, uh, bubble blowing. They take act, you know lessons. The whole scene, the whole world is lessons. Whatever the whatever the family does, it's for them. You could see this. And they came out, and I happened to be right there uh, buying a buying a paper or something. And they came out of this apartment house. And Daddy was a kind of vaguely defeated, gray-haired-looking man. He had a Homburg hat on, and he sort of ventured out on the street. And he's way, you know, he goes like that. Cab, cab. You know, hey, cab, cab. And this went on for about oh, maybe thirty seconds. And I was talking to the to the guy at the at the newsstand, so I happen to hang around. Cab, he's going. Well, you could see restiveness beginning to settle in on these two these two girls, one twelve, and all of a sudden, like a shot out of a cannon, it was like like rice krispies being shot out of a cannon, you know, boom, this little chick with the mustache, the little twelve year old girl with the high black boots, she says, Out of the way, Daddy, I'll get a cab. Cab 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 a cab slew to a halt. She says, all right, come on, let's go, let's go. And Daddy says, <laughs> he pulls his coat down, you know, and they all four of them get in the back seat of this cab. And you can see this little chick holding the door open. Finally, she climbs in. Boom! She says, uh, 85th and mad. Whoop! Well, where the cab goes. <laughs> oh, man, you know. And I thought, holy smokes, that utterly helpless bit. And I can see this little girl reading this piece on when to be utterly helpless. She's about as helpless as a cobra in heat. Uh, let's see what we got here. Oh, here's here I think is kind of a nice one. I mean, a lot of people are very sloppy in uh, what might be called natural emotions. Very sloppy. For example, how are you at crying? 
When you cry, what do you do? You go, ah! I mean, in, in other words, do you screw your face all up and become terribly ugly and just look rotten when you cry? Well, why don't you work on crying? Why don't you spend a little time working on it? Stand in front of the mirror and cry a little bit and see whether or not you're a good crier. And if you're not a good crier, throw crying out of your lexicon. Just don't use it. Some got it, some ain't. Now, now, how are you? How are you at smiling? Do you have a sinister, sneaky leer, and you've never known that it is a sinister, sneaky leer? In other words, you, you know, do you grin like like Peter Laurie about to close in? Eh? Maybe this is where you've been lousing up. Have to spend a little time standing in front of the mirror, practicing smiling. Work on a kind of nice crooked uh, William Holden smile. That's a good smile. Work on... Uh, maybe maybe you're not the William Holden type. Well, then why don't you work on uh, on a kind of a tart, mysterious, vaguely Audrey Hepburnish smile. As though withholding a lot more than you're offering. Try that one. Now, now here in the article, I think, is a very good suggestion. I really think this should be thought of seriously. Uh, the caption reads, Do you laugh often and do you laugh uh, freely? Do you? Laughter, like other musical accomplishments, improves... I never thought of laughing in the same breath with playing the banjo. That's a new concept. I just ran across that. I didn't say... <laughs> Laughter, like other musical accomplishments, improves with practice. Laughter is catching. And your distinctive laugh puts its stamp upon your personality. And now let's get down to brass tacks. To laugh freely. Tilt your head back. Keep your shoulders down. Avoid putting your hands up to your face. Keep the balls of your feet right down on that carpet. And let it go. Be very careful, though, about the shape of the mouth. And do not roll your eyes in opposite directions. <laughs> oh, isn't that sweet, huh? Well, I may be going out with a chick who's been practicing laughing. And you know, you can always tell that. Have you noticed the the, the unconscionable laugher? You know, uh, you say something that's mildly nutty, and you go, <laughs> Oh, Charlie. <laughs> you know what they all vaguely sound like? The canned laughter that you see behind these rotten TV shows. Uh, have you ever noticed that the, the TV shows the canned laughter? It's something, nothing happens, you know, like somebody picks up the ashtray and puts it down a year. Then it stops real quick. And then Danny Thomas or whoever it is says, Cut. <laughs> and then the girl goes, oh, and then Daddy goes, watch it, watch it, watch it, wow, wow, cut. Well, now uh, I think that we're living in a society that's uh, governing itself pretty much that way. Be very careful about your applause. You know, uh, a man will suddenly find himself applauding at the wrong moments. It can be very embarrassing to find yourself crying at the wrong things at a Broadway play. Things you should, for example, be laughing at. That's terrible. <laughs> like like some of the current comedies. <laughs> like Billy Wilder's comedies, I find are the saddest things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I sat through the apartment and I thought, oh, wow. <laughs> I sat through an entire 14 reel showing of Irma LaDuce and didn't laugh once. You know, and I wondered, I, I figured, well, gee, maybe it's me. And I think you can lose a lot of friends that way. I really do. Uh, because they're conditioned. They laugh at the right things. They can tell. They, they can tell when Joey Bishop is saying to you, I've just been funny. And you laugh. Uh, you know, they can tell. And they laugh at the right things. Wouldn't you like to be able to laugh at soupy sales? Really? Wouldn't you? Just think how you'd be loved by all of your friends. Just think, wouldn't it be great to be able to find, uh, say, uh, George Axelrod funny? But, uh, <laughs> you know, wouldn't it be just lovely if you could find Gertrude Berg funny? Wouldn't it be funny? Wouldn't it be great? Oh, sure it would. Nice. You know that. It'd be comforting somehow to be cradled in that soft, warm eider down of your civilization. Be a comedian, friends. Learn how to change your colors. Learn how and when to laugh. Learn when to cry. That's very important. 
And also, you've got to learn when to be concerned. Did you read about this playwright who just wrote a play? Uh, it was all on the front page of the Times drama section this week about this great tragedy, about how he was going to be drafted for six months at Fort Dix. And the whole play was about how they were cutting off his freedom. Gee, I wish I could get sad. You know, sorry about that. I really wish I could worry about that, you know. But it just seems, well, I got a bad knee, you know, and so many other things. Okay, Gene Shepard, February the, what, the 8th, I believe, 1965. And that wraps up this morning's broadcast. I'll be back Sunday night at 7.30 with the Golden Age of Radio, featuring Escape for the next couple of months and, uh, and other wonderful programs from bygone days. This is WBAI in New York. I've been Max Schmid. Thanks for listening. Wake up call follows after a couple of announcements, so do stay tuned to your listener sponsored and pay your pledges, ladies and gentlemen. And we'll see you Sunday or next week right here on Mass Backwards.